Starfield is a space exploration action role-playing game released in 2023 by Bethesda, those behind the legendary Elder Scrolls and Fallout series. The newest pillar IP from Bethesda in 25 years at conception, throughout its media releases and primary showcase, Starfield was touted to be the most technically advanced, exploratively limitless, and narratively complex offering yet from the developer. Pre-launch for many, the promises appear to be fulfilled, with many outlets offering Starfield praise for its planetary exploration, gunplay, and spaceship combat. And whilst not perfect like many new IPs with areas of improvement aplenty, it seemed as if Starfield had unironically shot for the stars and made it into orbit. However, post-launch and in the hands of gamers, Starfield more so began to seem as if it had only made it into the troposphere rather than space itself. Criticised for expansive yet empty worlds outside major settlements, repetitive quest design, lacklustre gameplay, and poor inventory management systems, Starfield, in a word, had been labelled as disappointing. As all things in life and RPGs in particular, however, impressions, experiences, and enjoyment are influenced by both personal choice and taste. So with that said, and with me being a fan of many of Bethesda's previous works, such as the legendary Skyrim, regardless of its mixed reception, I wanted to experience this adventure for myself and see if Starfield could reach the heights it aimed for, or if its post-launch decline truly represents its standing amongst Bethesda's best and worst. And what I can say for certain multiple playthroughs in, is that Starfield surprised me. If you are yet to explore the far reaches of the settled systems, spoiler warning for Starfield's main questline, some side quests, gameplay systems, and loot. Our journey begins as we descend, deep into a space mine accompanied by Supervisor Lin and Hella. Throughout the descent, Lin and Hella remind us of the rules, go steady, go safe, and go home with a pocket full of credits. Lin also remarks that with the amount of metal deposits down here, they will have enough credits to buy the helium needed to travel to the other side of the settled systems. More minerals, more money, the cycle repeats itself. In these opening moments, we are referred to as a Dusty, a new recruit, and it's alluded to that we may just be on our second outing. The narrative device of us being a new recruit acts as a nice natural way of introducing the basics of movement, however. We have our standard left stick to move and right stick to look introduction as we follow Lin through the tunnels, guided by our blue quest marker. Further into the cavern, we are instructed by Lin to grab a laser cutter, and the act of mining our first minerals acts as a basic weapon handling tutorial. By cutting into the deposits, we also learn here that we can actively gather resources from the environment, something we can quite literally keep in our back pocket for later. Once the deposits are drained, Lin calls us back, and making it through another slab of rock, Hella indicates that there are some spikes in gravity in the newly uncovered cavern. Lin alludes to this being the thing that the group are actually here to find, and that what they are searching for should read like the anomalous indications Hella is recording. Getting closer and the readings growing in strength, Lin instructs us, the Dusty, that we are up, and we need to go and investigate the readings. Being introduced to our flashlight, we make our way to a secluded part of the cavern and notice a large metal deposit with floating minerals surrounding it. We use our cutter again to break down the deposit, and we reach out and touch the strange metal object protruding from the rock. This sparks a vision of sorts, and we are thrust through the stars, accompanied by an orchestra, and awakened sometime later with Lin and Hella by our side. Here, Hella asks if we can recall who we are, and by peering into a data pad, we are introduced to the character creator. We get the typical facial features, body shape, and cancer customization here, and the system is simple and very approachable for those who don't want to delve into deep customization. But the slider options are a nice touch for those who want to spend a bit more time customizing their look. We also get to select some unique backgrounds that provide boosted ranks for specific starting skills, like a chef offering increased gastronomy, dueling, and scavenging ranks, for example. Additionally, we can select three traits from a list of interesting options, such as starting with a home but needing to pay a mortgage on it, or an adoring fan that can pop up at any time and be a pest. We will revisit these in more detail later, but I found these to be quite fun options for the most part. With our selections finalized, we are met again by Lin, who explains that a client is on his way to commandeer the strange object that we retrieved. Lin asks what we saw when passed out after touching the object, and we can express this in a variety of ways. But as we continue our conversation, we are interrupted by the indication of a ship arriving. Lin explains that it's the client, a member of the Explorer Group constellation, and so we begin to venture out to meet them. Making it to an airlock and getting a quick tutorial for equipping items by way of our helmet, we make our way outside and see the surface for the first time. Moving forward and looking to the sky, we hear the scream of an engine and a ship descends from orbit onto a nearby landing pad. And it is here that we meet Barrett, the client. 
He and Lin discuss a job of the past, and amongst this, Lin points to us having found the strange object and passing out upon retrieving it. Barrett seems to take a deeper interest in this point, and refers to our experience being a trip of sorts that he too has been through and done. After this remark, whilst Lin and Barrett discuss the exchange of credits for the object, they are interrupted as the scanners on Barrett's ship indicate another ship coming into orbit, captained by Crimson Fleet pirates. Grabbing our first proper firearm, we take position alongside the other Dusties, and a firefight breaks out. Overcoming the Crimson Fleet, we gather up some loot and make our way back to Barrett. He remarks that in having dug up what he refers to as an artifact and having experienced visions, we are now part of something bigger and we need to accompany him to Constellation. Lin, however, disapproves and with Barrett having brought the Crimson Fleet to their doorstep, he offers to send us to Constellation and he will take our place here as goodwill for Lin. Vasco will now help escort us to the Lodge, Constellation's base of operations, and we are gifted with a watch from Barrett, which will act as a key to unlock the Lodge. The watch also has a practical use in-game, as it acts as an extension of our HUD that displays planetary info, such as our location, the planet's gravity, and atmosphere. It also acts as a stamina meter, highlighting our available O2 levels used for sprinting or jumping. Now, with the watch equipped, and admittedly abruptly, we are given the keys to Barrett's ship, the Frontier, and are on our way to Constellation, taken to orbit for the first time. Here we get a simple ship system tutorial where the basic functions of flight and energy system management are explained. And we are also given our first taste of space combat by taking on some still pursuing Crimson Fleet ships. Taking them out, Vasco explains that the pirates are after the frontier, so to avoid further pursuit we need to take out the local Crimson Fleet leader. With our quest objective updated, we get a navigational tutorial and set course for the Crimson Fleet leader's camp. In landing, getting a quick introduction to the scanner, and making our way to an abandoned research center, we venture through the facility, taking out Crimson Fleet, and making our way to their leader. It's explained here that the pirates were after the frontier, as old legend suggests it holds riches within its cargo bay. We can get out of this situation in a variety of ways, however, through persuasion or through an attack. But either way, we will remain on the Crimson Fleet's radar, but their pursuit will be prevented for now. So with that problem now solved, we set a course and make our way to New Atlantis, the first major settlement we come across via the main quest. Line. Here we make our way through a bustling, futuristic metropolis of sorts and follow our quest marker to the lodge. Upon arriving, we are met by Sarah and the other members of Constellation that question our arrival in Barrett's place. With Vasco supporting our claims, we re explain the visions we experienced and we are asked to place the artifact on the table amongst the others. Here, the artifacts spring to life and it's suggested that they may form a set, with others possibly being out there for us to uncover. From here, we are now pushed forward by our next major objective exploration, and the discovery of more artifacts. We first work with Sarah, who wants to test us by following up on a lead from the United Colonies Vanguard about a potential artifact. This leads us to various other planets, piecing together the mystery of a potential artifact's location, and in doing so, we find a Vanguard volunteer, Morara, who on patrol came across an artifact and is more than happy for us to take it off his hands after we save him from the likes of some ecliptics, another spacefaring faction. Making it back to the Lodge with Artifact in hand, we add this to the rest and officially become a member of Constellation. Moving forward from here, the main quest line opens up and we now have various quests we can begin with different Constellation members chasing up leads on potential artifacts. We meet Sam Ko and his daughter Cora, who take us on a journey involving a bank robbery and family disagreements to uncover a map that takes us to a long lost artifact. Next, returning to Lin, who we can recruit for our ship's crew, we find that Barrett and Hela have been taken hostage by some Crimson Fleet that return for another attack. And in finding Hela, whom we can also recruit, we are then led to a base occupied by Crimson Fleet who have taken Barrett captive. Here we can negotiate Barrett's release with words or bullets, but either way, we help him make his way back to Constellation. Afterwards, we make it to the Eye, Constellation's literal eye in the sky, searching for anomalous readings in search for more artifacts, and meet Vladimir, who directs us to more anomalous readings to investigate one in which we work with another member of Constellation, Andrea, where we fight off more ecliptics in an abandoned research base, and in doing so, uncover another artifact. We then fight our way through an abandoned underground lab of sorts, leading to another cavern, and pick up the next artifact. Later, we also investigate a larger reading that turns out to be a temple of sorts, that once explored, provides us our first of many powers. This one of which allowing us to create a gravitational field that raises enemies into the air, making them vulnerable to damage. After returning to the Lodge and demonstrating our new powers for the Constellation members, Walter now shows an interest in us, and invites us to partake in the planned purchase of an artifact from a freelancer in the City of Neon. Undergoing a mission of black market negotiations, business politics and mercy depending on your choices, we obtain our next artifact. However, in leaving the City of Neon behind, we encounter the next driving force of the main quest line the Starborn. Encountering a ship of unknown origin, the Helix, a mysterious voice tells us that we don't deserve the artifacts, and they must intervene in our quest to uncover them. In demanding we hand over the artifacts, they believe that our lack of knowledge is the reason why we don't deserve to learn more of them, and our journey must end. 
We have a few choices here to either take the Helix on in combat or power up the grav drive, and in this instance, we choose to escape. Making it back to the lodge, we give Noel the scanning data from our ship, and the group are collectively confused and concerned about who these Starborn are and why they demanded the artifacts from us. Regardless of the Starborn's pursuit, however, we collectively agree to continue, and in adding the most recent artifact to the collection, we speak again to Vladimir, who provides us more locations of anomalous readings. From here, we uncover two more artifacts, each within a cave, but this time protected by Starborn, whom we have to overcome. Turning these into Constellation, we are asked to venture back to the Eye and help in some repairs. However, we seem to have made things worse and overload some systems. With the Eye now out of commission, Vladimir decides to make better use of our skills and tells us that he has heard stories of a Captain Petrov having obtained an artifact that he has added to a collection of sorts. Heading to the ship the Scow, we can negotiate our way inside for trade, and in doing so, meet Captain Petrov, who has a striking resemblance to Sheogorath from the Elder Scrolls series. Petrov though is a stubborn old captain, and although through flattery we can negotiate our way to see the artifact, we are unable to negotiate a trade and need to steal it. This inevitably causes a firefight to break out, however in shooting Petrov down, we can demand his guards to stand down, and by doing so, make our way back to the lodge. However, when turning in our new artifact, we hear trouble, and speak to Noel to see what's occurred. We hear from Vladimir that the eye has been attacked by Starborn, the Starborn in question introducing themselves as the Hunter, and he states that now he is here, our part in cleansing the unity is over. We need to say goodbye to our friends, and he is on his way to the lodge. Here we have the option of venturing to the eye and fighting back, or staying and protecting the lodge. In this instance, we choose to protect the lodge and begin to fortify our position. Whilst Noel works to contain the collection of artifacts, we hear a disturbance above and check on Walter. We now come face to face with a hunter who greets us with a hello again and follows this up with a duplication and laser fire. Although we try, we are unable to harm the hunter. And although we are overpowered, Noel secures the artifacts and we must flee. Making our way through a back exit leading to the well and New Atlantis, the hunter in pursuit, destruction is brought to the people of this city. And although security attempts to stop the hunter, he is relentless. Luckily, however, we make it to our ship and escape to orbit. Meeting the hunter's ship, the Scorpius in space, the collection of artifacts are referred to as the Armillary. In our questioning of what the Armillary is and what the artifacts mean, the hunter decides that we are making his job easier. He, in a way, gives us his blessing to continue collecting the artifacts and remarks that perhaps we will glimpse the unity yet. With the hunter grab jumping away, we venture to the eye and see the result of our choice to reinforce the lodge. Upon entering, we make our way up the main hall and find Barrett now past, a somber moment if you have invested time in Barrett's tale. We also come to find Sam, Andrea, and Vladimir injured, but luckily still alive. From here, it's determined that the Eye and the Lodge are no longer safe or secure, and with the Starborn competing to reclaim the artifacts, we need to keep them hidden. Here, we can choose to put the artifacts in a variety of locations, but for now, we choose to add them to our ship's inventory. Once the Armillary is secured, we make our way back to the Lodge and speak with Mateo, a religious figure of sorts. Mateo mentions that the unity that the Hunter mentioned in Orbit is a word that Mateo has heard before and it's an important concept in the Keeper Aquilus speeches, a priest of the Sanctum. The Sanctum believes that answers are always in the stars, and it is here that we speak with the priest at the Sanctum. Through pulling on various threads, we uncover a trail to the second planet of Indum, where a pilgrim's resting place lies, and points us towards the meaning of unity and another planet. Making it here pulls on more threads and leads us further into the stars, and we eventually uncover another location. Here we re-encounter the hunter who is not alone, and we are spoken to by the same voice from above Neon earlier. We are invited onto the Starborn ship for a ceasefire meeting, and in making our way aboard, we re-meet the hunter and formally meet the emissary. They explain that the Starborn are not a collective. They are individuals all in the search for the artifacts for themselves. In these moments, the meaning of the unity is finally explained. Here the Emissary is revealed to be Barrett, or at least a version of him, born from the Unity, which is described as not a concept, but a place. The Starbond duo explain that the Unity is a gateway to a multiverse, that allows those who access it to be quite literally reborn into a new universe, becoming Starborn. The artifacts, pieces of the Armillary, are the keys to the Unity, and in collecting them all, one can access the Unity and be reborn. It's also revealed that the Hunter is another version of Keeper Aquilus, one that has also been reborn through the Unity. After the big reveal, we can speak further with the duo, but on our exit, the Emissary gives us the location of another artifact on Old Earth that will show us the destruction that the artifacts can bring. Before moving on into the stars, however, we need to regroup back at the Lodge. In arriving, we speak with the others and explain what we have uncovered, the Armillary, the Unity, and the Multiverses. After discussing the morality of these discoveries with the others, Vladimir gives us one last anomalous reading, and with that, we have our final artifacts to discover. The first takes us into the quest Entangled, which we will look at in more detail later. But know for now that this is a really interesting quest that takes us to a research lab that then takes an unexpected turn into playing with the multiverse concepts we have just uncovered. Phasing between two alternative universes, this quest acts as a moral, navigational, and combative puzzle that leads us to an artifact. 
Claiming this one for our own, we move on to the next, which involves more cave exploration, and then onto our second to last artifact, where we venture between some abandoned moon bases that lead us to Earth and NASA's launch station. Here we learn that humanity's ability to traverse the stars through the creation of the grav drive was a result of experimentation on an artifact that was discovered long ago. Humans were able to reverse engineer the ability to phase through the stars from the artifact, but as a result, Earth was stripped of its resources, a high price to pay for the expansion into the stars. After escaping a starborn attack at the NASA station, we re-encounter the Hunter and Emissary, who further explain their beliefs and the use cases for the artifacts. In a way, the Emissary is about preservation and gatekeeping, whereas the Hunter is about self-empowerment, and we can choose to support either or neither of the Starborn. Here is where we can make our final choice of whom we wish to support, and in this instance, we choose neither. And in doing so, we unite the Hunter and Emissary, who vow to destroy us should we attempt to reach the final artifact. Well, look at that. The Emissary just became my new best friend. With our choice made, we venture to our final planet, and meet the Hunter and Emissary head on in a space battle, of which if you are not prepared, you will easily be overcome by the Starborn duo. In overcoming them, however, we can make our way to the surface and make our way through waves of Starborn Guardians who will throw everything at us, from their own weaponry to an army of resurrected ecliptics to stop us from reaching the temple. Amongst the firefights, we will also encounter various anomalies that take us through flashbacks of previous quests, including the opening with Lin and Hela and the scowl with Captain Petrov. Overcoming these obstacles, we make it to the final chamber and confront the Emissary and Hunter. Here our choice has been long cemented, and although with high enough investment in the social skill tree we can talk our way out of this, on our current path we have chosen violence and must attack them both. As we gun down the Starborn, the battle takes us to various places of importance that we have visited on our journey. We fight in the Lodge, the Well, Neon, and back to the NASA launch site. Eventually however, with enough firepower and medpacks, we overcome the Starborn, and in doing so we gather the final artifacts. In claiming them all, we are teleported back towards our ship, and by placing the newly acquired artifacts with the others, we complete the armillary. Now by keeping the armillary in our ship inventory, and grab jumping to anywhere of our choosing, we make it to the Unity. Here we find ourselves, or at least a version of ourselves, and the Unity's power and purpose is explained. By entering the Unity, we will leave the universe we know, and will start a life anew in a new universe, with our people and possessions staying behind, and our skills and knowledge intact. Should we choose, however, we can also walk away from the Unity and continue to live within our current universe. In this instance, we choose the Unity, and in doing so, we see the stars in all their glory and awaken anew on a starborn ship of our own, ready to make our way back to the Lodge and meet the members of Constellation again to find more minerals, more money, and with the cycle repeating itself. So in getting to this point and being reborn amongst the stars, we've had the opportunity and also displeasure at times to experience what Starfield has to offer. The gameplay loop of Starfield is much the same as many of Bethesda's and other first-person RPGs, consisting of obtaining a key questline that can be followed as the crow flies, or branched off from by encountering interesting characters, hearing rumors around town, or encountering lore and other communications whilst out exploring. Whichever path and approach is chosen, the player will be able to tackle these quests in a variety of ways, such as through combat, persuasion, or avoidance. In completing these quests, XP, credits and items will be earned that feed into the next quest choices and options. XP is used to gain skill points that can be invested into various traits to increase their effectiveness, such as increases in ballistic weapon damage. Credits are used to invest in better gear, ammunition, ships and loot. And minerals are used for gear upgrades and outpost creation. Quite literally, the gameplay loop, like the cycles of the Starborn, reinforce and build on themselves. Quest, gain, invest and repeat. Whilst there is nothing particularly unique about this loop in comparison to other RPGs, apart from the metaphorical reference to the cycle that I'm trying to stress for all it's worth here, in a word, the gameplay loop is enjoyable. The success of such a loop, however, relies heavily on the developer's ability to craft engaging questlines that motivate the player to continue onwards and engage in the gameplay systems available to them. When it comes to the main story, however, Starfield just doesn't quite hit the mark. Whilst there are some fun moments throughout, as many other reviews point out, there is quite a lot of uninspired busy work that the player must work through. And so much of the fun is relegated to the later hours, such as the acquisition of Starborn powers that are the equivalent to the shouts of Skyrim, and the more interesting and narratively complex quests being available many hours into the main questline, even revealing the most of the fun in the back quarter of the tale. Now this would be all well and good if on our way to find these artifacts there were interesting locations or experiences just off the beaten track we could explore, or strange objects and buildings that we could have a quick peek into that blossom into us finding a piece of lore that leads us down a rabbit hole. But alas, no. 
It would of course be unfair to say that there is nothing to explore amongst where the main quest line takes us. However, alternative locations, mysterious map markers, and interesting landmarks are so far away most of the time that it is rarely worth spending the time to check them out. Also, when entering orbit of new planets, ships or research centers may send you a distress signal or a transmission that can lead you down a rabbit hole of another quest. However, these always felt like they got in the way of the main objective I was there to complete, so typically they were stored in the backlog and left for later. With how vast some of the open and empty spaces are on some planets too, putting in the effort to go and see other locations can take up quite a lot of game time, and unfortunately, a majority of the time what you find is more uninspired busy work or disappointing loot. Amongst the main questline though, there are a few more interesting and involved story beats, and some of these are quite interesting. For example, on Neon, when we must work with Walter to purchase an artifact, once the mission gets going, we have the opportunity to use some persuasion and digi-picking skills to dig up some dirt on the cellar, which we can use as leverage in the negotiations. We also can take the time to gain a VIP package to put door control and security on our side for when the meeting occurs. Our choices actually matter, and it's really satisfying to shut the door in the face of the seller when they attempt to walk out when we don't negotiate a higher buying price. Later on too, in the main quest Entangled, instead of a straightforward quest to grab an artifact, we enter a research center that has been experimenting on said artifact that takes us to some unexpected places, quite literally. Here we are thrust between two universes, one where the research center was destroyed in a fire and is now overrun by hostile aliens with one sole survivor, and the other that is fully functioning apart from the laboratory's security lock down and heavily populated by staff. Eventually we get a device that allows us to traverse between the two worlds, navigating our way around the locked doors, security systems, and overgrown alien hives in order to make our way to the locked down lab to retrieve the artifact that is creating the pocket multiverse. In this quest, unless the player has followed very specific steps, they must choose one world to save, as the one they take the artifact from will be the world that is maintained. Will you save the many or the few? The choice is yours and adds a lot of weight to the final outcome. Side quests too, or at least the ones I experienced when pulled from the backlog, are also a good time. You'll have noticed throughout the video that my ship had changed, as did my spacesuit. And these I received from the very fun and very accessible Mantis side quest. In this quest, we explore a secluded bunker that has attempted to be commandeered by space pirates, and throughout the quest, we uncover the recordings from the Mantis that they have left for their successor. Making our way through the lair of the Mantis, we eventually must make a choice. Decide with a cowering space pirate that claims he can help us navigate some traps, or gun him down like the rest. Whatever the choice moving forward, there is a word puzzle that if we mess up, we will easily be taken out by some aforementioned traps. But if we can overcome the lair of the Mantis, we are rewarded with some incredibly powerful legendary gear, alongside a ship, the Razor Leaf, that with a simple upgrade to the Grav Drive can take us right through to the end game. Of the side quests I did, I have to admit the Mantis was by far one of my favorites, not just because of the lore I got to experience and the world building that the quest worked so hard to achieve, but also because of the great loot I was rewarded with at the end. It is a shame, however, that so few quests that I experienced have the same kind of magic or flair that these aforementioned quests did. And as already mentioned, for a lot of my game time, I felt as if I was doing busy work. Sure, you can argue that to make every single questline equally enjoyable and rewarding could be a large task for any developer. However, for the main questline in particular to have so much filler and copy and paste busy work that takes you to vast, uninspiring locations, I can see why so many others, and now myself included, label Starfield's storytelling as disappointing. Supporting the storytelling, however, and what I did find a highlight are the cast of memorable and enjoyable characters you can meet along the way. As the main questline unfolds, we have the opportunity to meet and work with a variety of interesting characters, such as the strong-willed leader Sarah, the intelligent businessman Walter, and even the surprisingly witty Vasco. Each character, even those from side quests, are well acted, and their voice lines are typically delivered with believability and effort. The Hunter in particular for me is a standout, with his raspy and devilish voice perfectly supporting his intentions and motivations. War, disease, famine, all the classics. In speaking to these characters we encounter along the way, we can also use various social skills to gain more favorable outcomes. By entering a persuasion event, for example, various dialogue choices will appear, varying in difficulty. In being successful with a choice, a bar will begin to fill, and once filled completely, we will receive an outcome, like reduced debt payments, passwords, or an attacker standing down. It does at times feel like RNG is the biggest factor in success here, but taking a gamble on a high risk, high reward dialogue choice was always fun. Apart from just story, quests, characters, and dialogue, however, what many players look forward to in their RPGs is the combat, of which for Starfield is comprised of firearms of various types, melee weapons, and fists, each of which including various different types of weaponry, such as pistols and laser rifles, that can be favored into a hotkey for quick access. For me, ballistic weapons were my preferred offensive option. However, when it comes to firearms, other options include laser, explosive, and EMP ranged weaponry. 
There are also implications for stealth in combat, with the typical crouch to hide and executing stealth hits resulting in increased damage. And on the surface, especially in comparison to the skill tree, which we will cover later, whilst the methods of engagement seem varied, the combat does unfortunately fall flat. Weapons just don't have a satisfying punch or thud that you would expect from a next-gen title. Yeah, Starfield isn't a first-person shooter at its core, but for how integral to the gameplay combat is, it is quite disappointing to not have the weapons feel more satisfying to use. In fairness though, aiming down sights is snappy and very accurate, and firing shots is incredibly responsive, but it is a shame that firing them feels like shooting a nerf gun rather than a deadly high caliber weapon. I can't add much commentary here to the melee weapons however, whilst in the Outer Worlds I performed a run with an all melee build, in Starfield this wasn't an option I engaged in, but there may be more fun to be had in this space. Combative options are not just surface level however, and can be developed further through increasing the effectiveness of various weapon types and also other key traits within the skill tree. When gaining XP and levels, skill points are rewarded that can be invested into various skills that provide buffs in combat and the world. For example, ballistic weapon damage can be increased by investing in the ballistic skill. How these are upgraded though is that each rank unlocks a challenge that needs to be completed to unlock the next. For example, to increase ranks in the pistol certification, a certain amount of enemies need to be defeated using pistols. Once this is achieved, the next rank can unlock, and so on. By choosing a different starting class as mentioned near the open, we can begin our journey with a variety of skills already increased in rank, which can give us a unique advantage moving forward. For example, the Space Scoundrel class gave me a boost to Persuasion, Ship Piloting, and Pistol Damage out of the box. The problem though is that the skill tree is so varied that you can miss out on certain skills or entire gameplay options depending on your skill preferences. For example, the ability to use jump packs, which are readily available in the world and offered as key quest rewards, can only be used if you unlock the skill. Same goes for operating additional outposts or hiring additional crew to ships. The other problem too, in comparison to some RPGs, at least for me, is if you choose to save your skill points but continue to use a skill that is already ranked, say the pistol certification, any enemies defeated by pistols will not count towards the next rank's progression unless you use a skill point to increase it. Therefore, unlike, say Skyrim, where a tree can continue to increase in level regardless of you investing a skill point, you will lose out in Starfield. And I learned this the hard way, only realizing later that I couldn't bank points without penalty. Also at the open, we can select three unique starting options. These can include access to certain dialogue choices, as already mentioned, a mortgage that we have to pay off, parents that survive, but we have to pay them 2% of our credits every week, and so on. I typically stuck to the more advantageous options here, but they do have a lot of variety and are a lot more unique than I've seen in some other RPGs. So whilst overall the tree is expansive and has a variety of interesting options to choose from, I did feel let down by how restrictive it ultimately felt. And yes, in the end, each build and skill point use is a choice, and this restrictive use of skill points could be seen as a benefit for experimenting in later playthroughs. Now, looking back in combat, this is not just relegated for the planet surface. Combat is also a key part for space exploration in Starfield. By accessing ship vendors at spaceports, the player can access a variety of ships for sale that have different inherent abilities represented by both their design and their power output. Some ships, for example, are built for cargo handling, where others have a focus on combat. Some too strike a nice balance between cargo and combat, such as the aforementioned Frontier or Razor Leaf. Ships also have classes that generally indicate their size and capabilities, with higher class ships being gatekept behind the piling skill and ranks. Besides just purchasing ships, the spaceport vendors also give us the opportunity to customize our ships through purchasing new parts and changing the position of current ones to provide benefits to certain traits. However, at least for me, the ship customization didn't seem very intuitive and it did feel quite restrictive. That said though, it's worth checking out some ship designs that others have made. I've seen people make Thunderbirds, Pelicans from Halo, and all manner of designs. Me though, I'm either not creative enough or too impatient to take advantage of this system. I wasn't too foolish, however, to misunderstand the ship upgrading system that is much simpler than customization. By using the same ship vendors, the player can purchase upgrades such as more powerful lasers and missiles, increased shields, and a larger grav drive, which is more of a bigger number good, a smaller number bad type scenario. All of these options of course lead to the stars and provide a variety of advantages, with bigger engines allowing for higher top speeds, larger grav drives allowing further jumps between star systems, and better weapons allowing for more efficient dispatching of enemy ships. On dispatching ships, the space combat in Starfield is quite straightforward, but also much more engaging than the surface combat. Ship weapons have a very satisfying thud and crack to them, and the combat is very fast paced and enjoyable. There is nothing quite as good in this game's combat as locking onto a fast moving target and firing your last missile to take them out. Other than just destroying a ship however, by targeting specific components, you can also disable ships, allowing them to be boarded. And in taking out the crew, you are rewarded with loot, resources, and a new ship should you wish to commandeer it. 
You also have the opportunity to recruit additional crew members that can provide bonuses to your ship when on board, such as allowing repairs on the fly when taking damage or increasing top speed, shields, etc. But the ability to do so is limited by both the class of ship selected as well as your investment in the ship command skill. Overall, the ship piloting, customization, and space combat are very engaging and are a gameplay system that the player can completely lose themselves in. And this for me is a highlight and a testament to what this game was trying to achieve. With the ship readily available and fuel essentially unlimited, depending on how far you want to go, exploration is also a massive part of what Starfield has to offer. It is a shame, however, that this offering is provided with what I consider a slap in the face, as Starfield has some of the most frustrating map and exploration design I have experienced in a game. In a majority of RPGs, we can explore maps of various sizes that have great levels of detail that both aid in visual storytelling and in exploration, as key landmarks and places of importance are easily identifiable and navigatable. With that considered then, let's have a look at the map of New Atlantis where we can find the lodge. Here I'm sure you can see, or perhaps not see what I'm talking about. The surface maps on Starfield are atrocious. Sure, there are a few key locations highlighted, but navigating to them based on this map alone is a chore. I have a feeling here that the developers were trying to engage the player in more exploration by not placing everything that can be discovered or experienced on the map. But no matter how beautiful or wondrous a new location looks, when I look at a map this disinterested in user-friendly navigation, I simply become disinterested in engaging with it. In defense of this though, Starfield does use procedural generation to create many of its worlds, so having equally detailed maps for these locations would be quite a feat. But what isn't defensible in my opinion is having maps for key locations lacking so much detail. If a random spot I landed on, on an off-beaten moon, didn't have a detailed map, I wouldn't mind, and I also wouldn't expect it, because moons for the most part are just barren. But a key location, such as the metropolis that is New Atlantis, or Aquila City, not having an easily accessible detailed map from the menu is really disappointing. It's not all negatives though. When we zoom out a little bit, we do get to see the great detail that was given to the various planets and star systems that we can explore. For each and every planet and moon, apart from key locations, as long as there is a solid piece of land to select, our ship can drop down and allow us to explore, which is quite impressive. Zooming out even further though, we can select any planet or moon in the system and select it to jump to. Further still, we can also select any star system within reach and jump to them as well. Something I had seen remarked a lot online though is that jumping between systems and planets and even landing on planets from orbit is not as smooth as first advertised. Instead of being able to enter orbit and fly to our destination, this is gated behind a loading screen, as is every other explorative option. Fast travel, loading screen. Orbit to surface, loading screen. Star system to star system, loading screen. Whilst it is incredibly convenient to select a mission and immediately be able to travel there from just about anywhere, the vast amount of loading screens you will encounter is staggering. Again, in Starfield's defense, if every planet and system had a seamless entry and exit with no loading screens, this would be an incredible feat, and I just don't think we are there yet with the technology. Another aspect of Exploration 2 comes from uncovering loot and unlocking doors and chests, which for me in particular always scratches an itch. And I can happily say Starfield has one of the more interesting lockpicking systems in an RPG in recent memory. Digipicks take the role as lockpicks and can be found throughout the world and are used to unlock various locks, doors, chests, etc. These locks range in difficulty of novice through to master, and the digipicking minigame is really satisfying. Here various rings with slots must be navigated with differing keys that need to be entered in sequence. Rather than just tackling one problem, there are multiple layers to consider, and one mistake early on can result in failure later. That said though, when you learn the rules and get used to higher level locks, this minigame can be incredibly satisfying to complete, and is much more engaging than a typical twist and feel for the controller's vibration like other lock picking mechanics typically have. Now as interesting as the loot and the lore is we can uncover behind locked doors and within chests, and as convenient as Starfield's fast travel system can be, you can't use it when over encumbered from all your collected loot, which will happen a lot. In Starfield, you can't just load your pockets or ship's cargo hold endlessly. The limit does exist here, but it is just so quick to reach the inventory ceiling that it makes you feel like you spend just as much time visiting vendors and waiting for their credit stock to replenish as you will exploring the settled systems. A nice touch though when over encumbered is you don't lose your ability to sprint. That said though, moving at all when you are over encumbered reduces O2 and builds CO2. So if you find yourself in the middle of a quest, unless you want to keep building CO2, which will damage you, you'll need to either make it back to your ship or take your time working through the rest of the quest slowly to finish it off and then make your way back. 
Of course, this acts as a punishment for overindulging and attempts to balance the loot system, but I'd much rather just move a little bit slower than build a gauge that can damage me from moving at all. Now, part of the reason the inventory limit can be built up so quickly is not only from weapons and spacesuits you can gather, it's also from the minerals and building materials you can accumulate through quest rewards, exploration, and the mining of minerals along your journey. Such materials include a variety of things from base minerals like aluminum, cobalt and nickel, to things like sealant and even physical structures like awnings or support beams. These items can then be used in the modding and crafting systems that Starfield has to offer. These include pharmaceutical crafting, which allows the crafting of medkits and various other packs and gear that can cure ailments such as cuts, breaks and muscle tears. Cooking can craft items like sandwiches that provide various buffs such as increased speed or carry weight. Engineering tables also allow us to craft pieces of crafting and modding components such as gauges and bits and bobs. Regarding modding, both weapons and spacesuits can be customized to increase various stats such as damage and accuracy. Weapons for example can have their sights enhanced, magazines extended, and even silencers attached through modification. Spacesuits too can have additional protections added and can also increase their defensiveness to ballistic or laser weaponry. Other mods such as increased carry weight or increased melee damage can also be added to enhance your current loadout. The problem though is that I more or less didn't engage with these systems for one reason or another. Regarding weapon modding, I always felt that just around the corner I was able to find a solid replacement for my favourite weapon, or I found a weapon early on that was so powerful I felt little need to upgrade it. As much as I loved the Mantis side quest mentioned earlier, once I rolled a set of Mantis gear with increased carry weight and reduced damage, I never found another piece of gear that matched or exceeded its core stats, so I never felt the need to experiment. I also never kept the resources required to make these choices on hand because they take up so much inventory space and I would sell them off or drop them as soon as I could. Resources required for crafting and modding aren't just relegated to being collectively rewarded for completing quests or actively searching for them in the world however. In Starfield there is also the option to establish and build outposts, which for the most part act as resource collection sites and additional landing locations for your ship. By finding a habitable planet, and using the scanner to place an outpost beacon, the player will have access to placing various structures that can generate and gather resources from the planet's surface. If focused on through an upgrade path, these outposts can also have crews stationed at them to keep things running, and can also have crafting benches built to allow for additional dedicated areas to upgrade your kit. Habitable planets hold various alien lifeforms too, so defensive options like turrets and security systems can also be input to allow the outposts to self-sustain themselves in your absence. The option to place these outposts is a nice touch, and I'm sure a lot of enjoyment can be found when they are invested in. However, with the clunky structure positioning and the again high resource dependence, these just didn't feel worth it to me. I also already had a place to rest my feet or modify my gear if needed at the lodge or on my ship, and these felt much less cumbersome. Whilst out and about in the world though, I can say that Starfield does a nice job of building the atmosphere through its sound design. Each planet and even orbit has an ambient music track playing, and the silence always seems to be filled by some form of music or natural sound from the planet. Ships too have a satisfying screech and thump when engaging their thrusters and entering orbit, and sound powerful. The sound design overall is wonderful, and although surface weapons as mentioned offer very little in this department, every other aspect including the aforementioned voice acting is a standout here. Now with all that said, in my introduction I prefaced this video by saying that Starfield surprised me, and in hearing my critiques you may be wondering how or why. On one hand, the main questline felt so flat in so many places that during the general fetch quests, I more often than not questioned why I was putting myself through this. It is truly a shame because so much of the fun is found later on. More powerful weapons, more powerful ships, more engaging quests, and more interesting skills are available far later on. In Skyrim, we receive our first shout, which is a staple of the gameplay loop, merely a few hours in, and its use is satisfying and powerful. Whereas in Starfield, we receive our first power many hours into the main questline, and these are simply forgettable, so much so I rarely use them because they never felt integral to the combat. Yes, you can argue that a lot of the more powerful gear and interesting quests in other RPGs are also found later on, but I highly doubt in some of your more beloved or even preferred RPGs, it took 10 to 12 hours before you really fell into the groove and immerse yourself into the world of that title. One should simply not have to play a game for multiple later hours before the fun kicks in, and this is why I feel Starfield failed in keeping its promises. Which is truly a shame because there seemed to be so much hope for this title pre-release and within its initial reviews. Weapons 2 felt so unsatisfying to use, and while snappy in their control, firing shots felt soft and dull. Exploration 2 felt incredibly disjointed, and because of the vastness of the world, there were so few times that I felt encouraged to check out what was just over the horizon, or investigate a mysterious location marker, which took a lot of the charm away from the exploration. 
The skill tree too, whilst varied, is so inflexible, at least for the way I play RPGs, and I felt forced to make a strategic decision each time I received a skill point. On the other hand though, Starfield ship combat and mechanics are incredibly enjoyable and engaging. Zooming through space and blasting space pirates and merchant ships apart delivered such a rush, and boarding to steal new ships to add to my fleet was so much fun. Some side quests too, like the aforementioned Mantis, provided such interesting lore to uncover, and was topped off by such satisfying and rewarding loot that I couldn't wait to see what the next side quest had to offer. The lock picking system is also one of the best I've experienced in recent memory, and never felt like a chore. It always felt fair, but also maintained a nice challenge when working on higher level locks. It was also a fun puzzle to solve, and I always relished coming across a lockbox or a safe to crack. The voice acting too, again I have high praises for the hunter, is fantastic. And although the facial expressions of the characters are lacking, their line delivery was always memorable and believable. But with this said, with all the critiques and negatives I've described, there is something special here, hidden deep below the surface. There will need to be a lot of work done to improve its gameplay and mechanics, and although you can't fix an already established main questline, the developers can continue to polish what is here. And I think in having made me say and believe this, there is another reason why Starfield surprised me. Although I have many criticisms, there are still many systems and aspects of this game that I enjoyed. And in focusing on these aspects like ship combat and side quests, I've come to find that I keep picking up the controller and booting up this title. I'm now 5 runs in and still enjoying discovering new quests and pushing the systems I enjoy to their limit. It's surprising because whilst it's far from perfect and commits a gaming sin, it too still keeps drawing me in, like a guilty pleasure. Quest, increase, invest, and repeat. The cycle repeats itself. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you very much as always. I hope you enjoyed it. I've decided to continue writing and creating these retrospective slash review style videos as I find a lot of enjoyment in writing and expressing my views on these games. And so I hope you found some value here. As always, I'd love some feedback in the comments. And if you have played Starfield, it would be great to read your thoughts below. As always, I appreciate you all and look forward to seeing you in the next one. Have a great day, gamers.